morning. I'm uh, Kel Sharak. I head up the uh, engineering team at Tari Labs in Johannesburg, South Africa. And uh, what I want to tell you a little bit about this morning is who we are, uh, what we're doing, and uh, give you a few words about what you can expect if you think you're writing a project using Rust. And if you're not interested in Rust, that's OK. I've got some memes that you can look at. So who are we? Tari Labs is a startup. We're based in Johannesburg, South Africa, where our engineers are. And there's a team in Oakland, California. And the founders are these three fine gentlemen over here. Naveen Jain uh, is a serial entrepreneur. And he's uh, worked in the music industry for many years, uh, worked with artists like Bon Jovi and Nine Inch Nails. Dan Therese is a stalwart of the ticketing industry. Um, he founded uh, Ticketfly. Um, and I'm not sure who the guy in the middle is. Um, Maybe you recognize his alter ego. Um, rumor is it, I'm not sure if this is true, but he's the uh, chief election officer of Montenegro. Um, so what we are up to is two main projects at the moment. Uh, firstly, we focused on the Tari Digital Assets Network, uh, which is a cryptocurrency coin based on Mimblewimble. The proof of work is merge mined with Monero. Um, we're doing some very interesting work on multi-party payment channels. So if that kind of thing floats your boat, please come and join us and, and give us your ideas and help on that. Um, and then we're, what we really want to do is, is have a second layer uh, digital assets network, so a smart contract platform that uh, uh, allows you to create native digital assets, things like tickets, collectibles, loyalty points, that sort of thing. So that, that's really the focus of Tari. Um, and we're doing all sorts of cool things. We've got Musig. Um, everybody loves them some Musig. Uh, I believe it's the first implementation in Rust, uh, for certainly on Curve 25519. And if you want to play around, we have a, a Rust pen, uh, a play playground, rustpen.tari.com, where you can go and we, we publish all our crates and crypto as we go, and you can kind of play with Musig and secret keys and so on. And that's all built in Rust. And then we also have Big Neon which you should all be familiar with, because Big Neon ran the tickets for this conference. Um, it's a mobile-first ticketing platform. Um, and what makes it unique is that it's totally open source. It's a batteries-included ticketing company that if you want to sell tickets, you can fork the code and, and run your own ticketing company. Um, so the idea is that this is, this is going to be a, a demonstration of that how you can actually run a company on a blockchain and generate revenue and be profitable. And when the Tari, when the digital asset ne networks launch, the, block, the big neon tickets will be blockchain enabled. And you'll be able to do cool things like um, if a scalper sells a ticket, the, the smart contract will give a royalty to the original stakeholder, that sort of thing. So um, it's, it's, it's quite exciting. We actually uh, have, we launched in January, and we sold our 10,000th ticket in April. So. Uh, yeah, we're pretty happy about that. Um, and the API in Big Neon is also in Rust. Um, but before we uh, get into that, let's address the ele elephant in the room and say, why, why did we use Rust and, and not the Pony programming language? So you know, Rust is a low-level systems programming language. It's really focused on producing high-performing code. And there are a lot of interesting safety features um, around the language design that we'll get into a little bit. Um, and so is Pony. Pony is a, a language that's written for high-performance code. Um, but I'm really not really, I don't really want to get into a comparison of these two languages. This is really just a flimsy pretext for me to regale you with a, a series of increasingly terrible Pony-related puns. So and I, while I talk about Rust. <laughs> so look. When you're developing a cryptocurrency project, uh, high-performance code is, is critical, right? So choosing a language, you have to have something that, that runs quickly. And the idea that Rust has some of these memory safety features is quite attractive. So it essentially, it's going to eliminate a whole bunch of bugs um, that you don't have that you would have to give due consideration if you're using, say, C++ or a language where you have to do your own memory management. Um, when we, when we started to look at Rust, we found that I mean, the, the tooling is amazing. There's a package manager, yay. You know, um, if you come from a, like a, a JavaScript or Node.js background, uh, 
you know, feels kind of comfortable to have package management. Um, the documentation is excellent, and the, the community is really opening and, and, and friendly. If you go onto the Gitter channel, the, the Rust developers will actually help you out. Um, on the other side, Rust is still fairly young. It's about three years old. The compiler is not totally stable yet. Um, there are changes that come in from time to time, which can be frustrating. Um, the third-party ecosystem is not maybe as polished and as mature as it could be. Like, for example, when we were developing Big Neon, I mean, there are API servers, there are database ORMs available, but they're really not quite there yet. But it's workable. And so, I mean, at the end of the day, I think um, Rust was the right choice for us. So in the last six minutes or so, um, I'm just going to very quickly show you some of the things that uh, we've come across experienced uh, working with Rust. Um, so um, let's begin with type safety. OK, so this is one of the it's not particularly unique to Rust. Other strong type languages have a similar sort of idea. But let's say uh, you've got, we're writing a crypto project, so we've got things like secret keys and digital signatures. Now, these two, these two entities are really the same data. It's just a big number. Um, Atari, we're very focused on UX, so we have a function that can print your signature onto the screen. Um, and then you, you, know, you write some code, and you, you know, want to print your signature out. But you know, we wouldn't make bugs like this. But it's possible. You accidentally now print your secret key, or you send your secret key instead of a signature. Um, you know, this is the kind of bug that can happen. What you can do is, in Rust is you can create types uh, and, and wrap that big number around a specific kind of type. And we call it secret key and signature. And now in the in your function, you actually take a, a signature instead of just the generic scalar. And then the compiler will stop you right there. OK. So like I said, this is not Rust. Rust this is not specific to Rust. Other languages have this kind of features as well. But what is quite nice is that this overhead here gets stripped away by the compiler. It's called a zero cost abstraction. And you actually get exactly the same compiled code um, using the safe method as you would if you used the, the code over here without the bugs. All right, anyone who's dallied with Rust at all will have heard of this concept called the borrow checker. Now, the central, feature feature ship, the central feature of Rust is this idea called ownership. Uh, that quote comes off the Rust documentation. What it means is that every value in a Rust program in memory has this a nominated owner. There's this concept that one, there's a variable that owns that memory location, and there's exactly one of these things. And when that owner goes out of scope, you can free the memory. Now, what does this mean? It means you kind of get free management, so you don't have to explicitly go and free memory all the time, which is nice. You also don't have to worry about a garbage collector. So a language like Java, you also don't have to free memory variables explicitly, but what you have occasionally is something that's running in the background and will come clean up after you um, after some time. So that's not ideal if you're running like a cryptocurrency or financial software, and you don't want things floating around in memory longer than they definitely need to be. So these two things combined give you this amazing property of blazing speed. Um, what you also get is this kind of carefree manage memory management. So, I mean, this is kind of some of our, this is sort of what comes out of a code base somewhat. Um, but you can say when a, a secret key goes out of scope, you want to just clear that memory and write it out with zeros. And then when you're using it, you don't have to explicitly free anything. It will do it for you. The compiler will stick that code in, which is nice. Um, However, so you've got all these nice, there's also like a, a, a bit of a dark side to Rust. Um, let's start with the program everyone writes. When you start a new, learning a new language, we're going to write hello world. Um, so we're just going to write hello MCC on the screen. Um, and we're just going to keep a reference to that variable so we can do something with it. OK, let's run it. Ah, shit. Um, OK, so what's happened here is that when we did this assignment, uh, the, the Rust ownership rule said, oh, well, 
S now is the owner of the string, so name doesn't exist anymore. So sorry, you can't you can't reference it anymore. The compiler won't let you write, run this code. Um, so this is a pretty standard experience for a new Rust developer, and about three hours later, that's the standard experience. But after a while, you get to embrace the the quirkiness of the the borrow checker, um, and it it lets you actually do some pretty funky stuff. So um, if you take the if you like take these properties of ownership and another feature of Rust is what's called fat enums. Um, you can create really safe APIs. So like uh, you implement it as a state machine, um, and you can, you can create really safe APIs that it's very difficult to get into an inconsistent state and very difficult to move accidentally from one state to an, in, an, in, an invalid state. So nice, I don't have time to get into the details, but if you, if you are keen to see quite a nice example of this, you can look at the mu our music implementation on, on our GitHub code base. Um, so <laughs> we shouldn't be drawn into complacency, right? Um, you know, you get all these nice memory and safety guarantees, but that doesn't mean you can't do stupid things. Um, so here's an example, uh, overflow check. So you know, if we're sending a Tari transaction, we want to check whether there's any change. And if there is, we're going to create a change output. Um, and so you need to do some checks, right? First of all, that you're not trying to spend more money than you have. Um, and otherwise, you know, create the change output, or if, or if you've got the exact amount, just carry on. And this is perfectly fine code. I mean, this is 100% this is workable. It's just you know, a little bit ver verbose. And, and while it doesn't overflow in practice, it overflows my text box, which is a bit of a visual pun. Um, but so that's, that's, that's great. What you don't want to do is go, oh, uh, Rust got type safety. So we're just going to make it an unsigned integer, right? All the change must be positive, And we're going to just have this formula over here, use the same formula. If you're really lucky, that'll crash uh, if you're trying to spend more than you have. If you're really unlucky, it overflows, and you, get, you create millions of tarries. So that's not good. Um, but what you can, uh, Rust idiomatic, uh, Idiomatic Rust, you want to do what's called a check subtraction. And you use these features of uh, it's still an unsigned integer. But if it tries to go negative, it'll actually return this concept of a none. And you can actually check for the exact cases that you're interested in. Um, and I just want to point out that this code does exactly the same as that code, but it just kind of looks a lot cleaner and uh, much more readable. And th that's kind of one thing that I've found in Rust is that even though it's a fairly low-level language, it really can make for beautiful, elegant, readable code, um, which, is, which is very, you know, when you're reading other people's code and you're doing code reviews, that's super helpful. Um, so yeah, basically, Rust can be frustrating. Um, you know, it takes a while to get used to its quirks. Uh, it's still quite young. Um, but really, these, some of these memory, memory guarantees that you get and the type safety, uh, it just wipes out whole classes of bugs that you can focus on on other things, which is, which is really nice when you're doing financial software. Um, so come along and join us. We're on uh, IRC, hashtag Tari Dev, if you want to um, join the party. Uh, we're at Tari on Twitter. And our code is all on GitHub. Thank you. Mm -hmm.